Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. We have a great crowd. I'm so happy to be here at Simmons College. Um, Reverend Cosby, congratulations. Thank you. I know this spring Simmons College was named the 107th historically black college and university, so fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've heard said before that passion is really about persistence over time, and I think you and, um, and the leaders that have worked so hard here at Simmons um, exemplify that. So thank you. Thank you very much for thank hosting you, us tonight. Um, I love Simmons College, and I'm really excited about the, the program tonight. Uh, we've done this faith and philanthropy one other time um, just several years ago, and, and uh, it was met with um, resounding applause, and, and people said we'd love to hear more. I'll tell you, we're going to hear about uh, traditions, um, giving traditions and faith philanthropy, uh, but I wanted to share for just a minute um, about my own tradition in my, in my faith. So do we have any Catholics here? Oh, that whole side. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a wedding. <laughs> I know I'm taking up too much time already. So, <laughs> okay, so you know what this is. If you're Catholic, what, what do you call it? Maria, what would you call it? A what? A pledge card. Okay. I call it a budget. I grew up in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, uh, my mom and dad have both passed, but my mom took us to church every Sunday. And I remember her distinctly being in the dining room because we didn't have offices and studies then, at least, no, they're just were no offices or studies. And she was at the dining room table, there were seven of us, and we're getting ready to go off to 8.30 mass. And it, we were sort of fend for yourselves, but you had to show up and you had to get in the car and you had to be well dressed. But my mom was busy with the budget. Now, Kara Barabo in our office said, what do you mean the budget? She said, are you talking about the donation envelope? But we didn't know it as the donation envelope, it was known as the budget. So my mom, and we used cash then, we didn't have Maybe we didn't have a community foundation <laughs> at that time, um, but we didn't have checks. So my mom, I think she put $5 in, and then I watched her lick the envelope, and then we were ready to go. So now I go to St. Francis of Rome, and I know Maria and John, they sit across from me. They're always asking me to come across and sit with them, and I said, no, I'm a true Catholic. I'm in my own Catholic bubble, sort of over on the side. I don't want to get that close to people, but every week, um, before I go to church, I have a special drawer, just like my mom did, not in my dining room, in my front hall, and I take out my budget, look for the date, and then I write out a check to St. Francis of Rome. And I write out a check for $25. Now, I don't know if that's generous or not, but <laughs> I don't know if I've kept up with inflation, um, but I watch some people put dollar bills in. I think it's whatever you can. Um, so whether it's tithing or, or not, um, I've just always felt that um, I've, I'm very privileged to have grown up in a family. I feel very privileged to have grown up in a family where this idea of giving back and having it connected to my faith um, has just always been very important. And for those of my brothers and sisters that still go to church, I know they carry out the tradition as well. So I thought I'd share that with you um, this evening. I want to introduce Sarah Reed Harris, who's Managing Director of um, the Council on Interfaith Relations, and she is going to, the Center for Interfaith Relations, and she's going to introduce our esteemed panel and conversation this evening. Thank you. Well, I feel uh, quickly compelled to tell you my father was an Episcopal priest and uh, taught us 10 10 80. Our rule of thumb was save 10% give 10% away, and live on 80% of your income, and that is drilled deeply in me. My name is Sarah Reed Harris, Managing Director of the Center for Interfaith Relations, and on behalf of our Board of Directors and the talented professional team, we are delighted to partner with the Louisville Community Foundation on this evening's Interfaith Panel. Many of you know us for our marquee <laughs> event, the Festival of Faith. Uh, next year's festival will be May 17th to the 21st at Actors Theater. Our theme will be Sacred Wisdom, Pathways to Nonviolence. When we're not planning the Festival of Faith, we are looking for opportunities to partner with thoughtful and engaged organizations in our community, like the Louisville Community Foundation, 
and to engage in interfaith dialogue on matters of contemporary concern. We call these dialogues conversations on meaning. Tonight's panel will explore the role religious institutions play in teaching philanthropic values and how current trends may impact future charitable support. It is my distinct pleasure <coughs> to introduce to you a truly extraordinary group of Louisville's finest and most insightful faith leaders who bless our community with their presence. Reverend Dr. Kevin Cosby, president of Simmons College, the 107th historically black college and university in the United States. Also our host for the evening, uh, Reverend Cosby is also pastor of St. Stephen's Baptist Church, 14,000 congregants at St. Stephen's mm -hmm. Baptist Church, and the largest employer of African Americans in the state of Kentucky. Wow. Rabbi Galia Rooks has served the congregation Adith Israel Brit Salom since 1988. Did I say it correctly? Close. Close. <laughs> the temple, we just called it. The temple, which is called the temple, is Louisville's largest and oldest Jewish <coughs> congregation. Rabbi Rooks directs worship and ritual, numerous education initiatives, and oversees all of the music at the temple. In 2013, she was named one of Louisville's most fascinating women. <laughs> Dr. Mohammed Babar is both a local faith leader and the medical director of Oaklawn Nursing Home and Jefferson Place Nursing Home. He's past president of the medical staff at Jewish Hospital and St. Mary's Healthcare, now Kentucky One. He credits his prominence in civic engagement to the generous support of the Pakistani American community that has become so vibrant in our community. Our moderator this evening is Dr. John Davis, who served as pastor for Springdale Presbyterian Church from 2009 <coughs> to 2014. Currently, he teaches theology at Bellarmine University. And without, uh, I will make a note, we will wrap up the uh, conversation around 6.45. Uh, we have uh, some uh, possibility of some of our speakers having to get out to an event, so we thought we'd wrap it up and give it enough time so that we can safely move on at the end of the evening. And without further delay, uh, we invite Dr. Davis to begin this evening's dialogue. Thank you so much. Technology, here we go. <coughs> Ah, well, it is a true joy to be a part of tonight's conversation and to be up here with you all. Uh, again, uh, Rabbi Rooks, Dr. Cosby, uh, Dr. Babar, let me uh, just reiterate and join the gratitude that's been expressed here for your presence and also for what you mean to this community and for what you are doing to help this growing dialogue across faith traditions here in Louisville. Uh, shalom, salam, and peace of Christ be with you. We do hope to save some time for questions at the end, so let's go ahead and begin our first question tonight. Uh, and we'll start with you, Dr. Dr. Cosby. Can you share with us some of the underpinnings of your faith tradition uh, in philanthropy and how you teach uh, this idea of philanthropy to your faith community? Um, thank you, and uh, first of all, welcome to Simmons College of Kentucky. We are honored to have you. And uh, to my colleagues, it's good to see you again. Um, the black community loves their church. Um, they are Jesus fans, not always Jesus followers. <laughs> but they are, they, they are fans of Jesus. And they love the institutional church. I think all the statistics that show a decline in church attendance, the African-American church defies those numbers. That we have not had the precipitous drop in attendance that the other uh, Christian denominations uh, have faced. Now there are some challenges with the millennials, but even that, we still are able to draw the millennials to our church. And the reason why, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, in his book, The Souls of Black People, says that the church was more than just a quote unquote religious organization, but it was the center and the life of the black community.
community. James Cone, the uh, father of liberation the theology, paraphrases the Johannine gospel, the, the prologue to the gospel of John, gives it a unique twist and says, in the beginning was the black church and the black church was with the black people and the black church was the black people and that the black church shined in the, in the whiteness and whiteness could not put it out. And basically what he is saying is that it was our, our place of refuge and asylum. Um, it, it was the only institution that we controlled. Um, families were illegal, but the church, what was called the underground institution, was the source of our strength, sanity, and liberation. Uh, last, early this year, we all grieved because of the tragic shooting that took place in South Carolina. But that church was the church that gave birth to Denmark Vesey, who was one of the great slave leaders or who revolted along with Gabriel Prosser and Nat Turner. So when you think of black leadership, you think of Reverend Nat Turner, you think of Reverend Frederick Douglass, you think of Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., you think of Reverend Benjamin Mays, you think of Reverend Al Sharpton, you think of Reverend Jesse Jackson, because all of our leadership emerged from the black church because the black church gave African Americans a counterculture consciousness. During the week, you were a domestic, you earned someone's clothes, you scrubbed someone's floor, you, you were the nanny, or you, were the, you worked a menial job during the course of the week. But on Sunday morning, you were given an alternative consciousness of yourself. So on Sunday morning, you dressed up, and that's why that tradition of dressing up in the black church is still so important because that was the only day that we were able to put on ties and suits and dresses and feel good about ourselves. In addition to that, it was the place where we learned leadership. We learned how to do parliamentary procedure. So the maid during the week on Sunday became president of the choir or chairman of the deacon board or the president of the missionary society. So what does that do to one's self-esteem to be able to come to an institution where you're not called by your first name, but you are, you're called, you're given a title of respect. And it's for that reason that African Americans support their church because of, of the vital role that it plays in our liberation and empowerment. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Thank you for that response. We'll just move right on down here and uh, hear from you, Rabbi Rooks, next, <coughs> if you're willing. Okay, well, that was really impressive. Um, want to repeat the question? Sure. <laughs> can can you share with us some of the underpinnings in your faith tradition when it comes to philanthropy and how you go about teaching this? So sort of the belief and the practice. Yeah. Okay, well, um, the word for charity in Hebrew is actually tzedakah, or in Yiddish, tzedakah. I use the two interchangeably. Um, and it's not the same as charity. The root of the word charity, karitas, comes from the Greek, and it means love. And it's a wonderful concept that you, you give money to help other people out of love, out of the kindness of your heart, and, 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 and to help others. Um, but the root of the word tzedakah is tzedek, um, I'm sure uh, Reverend Cosby knows uh, tzedek, tzedek, tirdof, justice, justice shall you pursue. Mm -hmm. So the root for the word tzedakah is justice or righteousness, doing what is just and right. And it's not something that you do out of the goodness of your heart, although it's better to do it with a loving heart. Um, you do it because you're commanded to do it. And of the 613 commandments in the Bible, um, there are 
about half are positive commandments and half are negative commandments. So like on, on the top 10, like David Letterman's top 10 list, <coughs> thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not steal, things like that. And positive, those are negative commandments. Positive commandments would be like remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy or honor thy father and mother. So um, in the Talmud, it says that the commandment of tzedakah is the most important of all the positive commandments. More important even than love the eternal one, your God, is to do justice. And there are various places in the five books of Moses, well, throughout the Bible, that, that really define what it means to be a just and righteous person and a just and righteous society. Um, and I, you know, I brought some of the quotes with me. I thought there'd be a table here for us to hide our notes. But um, <laughs> <laughs> failing that, um, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 7 and 8, it says, if there be among you one who is needy, one of your community, within any of your gates, in your land, which Adonai your God gives you, you shall not harden your heart, nor shut your hand from the needy neighbor. Rather, you shall surely open your hand and shall surely lend sufficient for whatever is needed. <clears throat> there are other places in the Talmud that talk about just as you care for the sick, whether they are Jewish or not Jewish, just like you um, give bread to the hungry, whether they're Jewish or not Jewish, just like you would bury the dead, help that to happen, whether they're Jewish or not Jewish, um, you're, you're always commanded to treat others equally because that is the path to peace. And um, that is instilled in Jews from a very, very young age, the idea of um, doing justice. And so that's, that's what philanthropy is. It's not goodness and kindness that we do. It's something we're commanded to do. And um, there are all kinds of quotes in, in, throughout the Hebrew Bible that talk about um, how we are called, God says at one point to Abraham, um, not to Abraham, to Isaiah, that you shall follow the tradition of Abraham and Sarah and be righteous and do righteousness and do justice because that is your inheritance and that is what you need to be passing down to future generations. Um, and the idea of doing justice, it's a very action-oriented thing. So it's not just, not that there's anything wrong with sitting in the uh, study or the dining room and writing checks, that's great. Um, believe me, that's great. Um, but also feeding the hungry and sheltering the homeless and, and clothing the naked and whatever is required. Like it says in Isaiah, um, when God says, is this the fast that I ask for, that you should sit in sock, sackcloth and ashes and, and, and fast all day and moaning about how hungry you are. Yes, that puts you in touch with how other people are hungry, but God says, I didn't ask for that fast. Rather, is, this, is not this the fast I ask for, that you unlock the shackles of slavery and that you... Um, shelter the homeless and feed the hungry, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but I see people nodding, so hopefully I'm, um, but taking care of poor people is just totally essential in Jewish life. And um, even in the old country, you know, whether that's uh, Lithuania, Russia, Poland, Germany, wh wherever people are coming from uh, before they came to America, um, even the poorest, poorest, Jewish families would give tzedakah right before the sun set on Friday evening because you don't handle money in traditional Orthodox Judaism. Um, you don't handle money on the Sabbath. The last thing you do is you put, even if it's just one little kopeck, in the tzedakah box. And um, I should have brought some tzedakah boxes to show you. Um, we have a 1901 tzedakah box mm -hmm. from Russia from what is now the Jewish National Fund, which in 1901, they would never have believed that we'd be living in our own land and you know, as a, as a sovereign nation again. But there have always, throughout history, been Jews living in the land of Israel. And so 
a couple of times a year, whether you were in Minsk or Pinsk or Belarus or wherever you were, someone would come by collecting money to help support the scholars and the rabbis who were living in Israel. And of course, there's that famous scene in Fiddler on the Roof. I hope everybody's seen Fiddler. I love that movie. I know it's so stereotypical now, but I love it anyway. And, and, and the guy, is a, he's a professional schnorrer, you know, he's a beggar, that's what he does. And it's, there's no shame in being a beggar. And the guy gives him, I don't know, a kopeck, and he says, only one kopeck, last week you gave me two kopecks. And he says, well, I had a bad week. And he said, you had a bad week, why should I suffer? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's that sense of entitlement. And, and, and to be honest, it really is, it really is a sense of entitlement. Um, also in Leviticus it says, and this is mentioned several places, that when you reap the harvest of your field, you're not allowed to reap the corners of the field. And anything that, um, anything, that me? anything that falls to the ground while you're harvesting, while you're reaping the harvest, it, that belongs to the poor and the hungry and the widow and the orphan and the stranger who lives among you. So, it doesn't even belong to you. I mean, in a certain sense, we know that, that all the land, everything belongs to God. God created everything, and everything belongs to God. But when we are entitled to use that land, we still leave the corners of the field. And you know, when you um, go through the grapes in the vineyard, you're not allowed to go through a second time, or beating down the olives on the tree or something. Because what's left after the first pass belongs to the poor and the homeless. And um, we know from the book of Ruth, just as a side story, that that was actually practiced. Sometimes, you know, we read stories, things in the Bible, and we wonder how much was that really practiced? Well, here we have an outside, well, it's still Bible, but, you know, not in the five books of Moses, but much later in the book of Ruth, and Naomi says to Ruth, you know, go follow after the gleaners in the field because whatever falls to the ground, you're, we can have that. And so, um, you know, one of the questions that I always pose to, to my congregants is what are the corners of our fields? I mean, I'm, I'm a city girl. I'm, I'm from Boston. I'm a northerner, a Yankee. <laughs> and how, you know, I mean, I've never had a field to leave the corners, but how do we do that? And of course, I'm sure you all know different ways. And we teach it to our children from the youngest age. Um, our kids start Sunday school in kindergarten or pre-kindergarten, and they come every Sunday. Our, uh, we have a set curriculum and a paid faculty and registration and all the rest of that. It's a very serious thing. And the first thing we do every morning is take attendance and collect tzedakah. And um, so the little kids know that they always bring coins, they always bring money um, to Sunday school every Sunday. And hopefully by, by instilling that in a very young age, everyone when they become bar bat mitzvah when they're 13, they're given um, a Bible, a study, the Jew, Jewish study Bible, and a tzedakah box. Because becoming a bar mitzvah when you're 13 is a, a child of the commandments, the highest commandment, positive commandment, would be, you know, to take care of all of God's children. And so we hope that it's not just the day of becoming bat or bar mitzvah, but, but you know, the path that they will be leading the rest of their lives. Wow, thank you. And the question asked, what were the underpinnings? But this is almost we, when you consider the concept of tzedakah, uh, 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 mm -hmm. if I'm saying that correctly, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's more an overpinning than an underpinning, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I guess. It's yeah. overarching, yeah. 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 Good. Dr. Babar, we're so eager yeah. to hear from you as well on the same oh, question, sorry. and I'll, I'll read it again, um, if it'll uh, help. No, I'm so honored to be with uh, Reverend Cosby and Rabbi Galia, and uh, it's an honor. And I'm kind of overwhelmed being in this historic Simmons College, knowing the history of this college. Mm -hmm. And then thanks, uh, Reverend Cosby, for sharing with us. Thank you, friend. Even we are discussing philanthropy and compassion in our faith traditions, and it reminds us the current events going on within our own country, the events which are taking place at University of Missouri at Columbia, that, that we, have, uh, we have done a lot, we have come a long way, but this journey has not ended. There's, a, there's so much we need to do to elevate our, our humanity through the spirit of compassion. 
So like I think you guys have made my job much easier that we have the common t underpinnings, the tenants uh, in all the faith traditions, especially the Abrahamic faith traditions. In Islam, the basic the concept is, like other faith traditions, that everything belongs to God Almighty. And we human beings hold it in trust. And there is, uh, in Holy Quran says that there is already a predetermined share of others in your fortunes. And now it's up to you that you return their share to them. So if somebody is coming to me and if somebody I see that they are in need, it's not that I'm doing a favor or a, doing a compassionate action, but it's imperative on me to return their share to them, which God has already predetermined in my livings. It's, uh, and compassion is the most common word used in Holy Quran, and the compassion, philanthropy goes hands in hand. And Holy Quran says multiple, at multiple places in uh, our scripture that uh, th you shall not attain uh, righteousness unless you give what you hold dear to you. It says that, uh, the Holy Quran says that uh, the one who's righteous is the one who gives his wealth away in the love of God Almighty to poor, to orphan, to needy, to wayfarers, and to set slaves free. Similarly, the, uh, it's mandatory upon us to give the minimum level of charity which we call zakat. So in, is, in Islam, the charity is obligatory and then voluntary. Under the obligatory, it's zakat and sadqatul fitr. So zakat is the minimal amount which the Muslims are supposed to give above a certain percentage. So it's in the current dollar amount, if you are holding more than $4,000, four it's like in the religious terms, it's three ounces of gold, which comes to, I think, 87 gram of gold. So if you are worth is more than that, which is probably $4,000, so you are supposed to give 2.5% of your wealth. Uh, this is the minimum, which is the, and it's mandatory. And it's the, it's supposed to, the basic concept is it should go directly to the human beings. Yes, within the Islam, we have our own schools, uh, 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 thought processes and we have different schools of principles but the, the majority of, uh, of the scholars agree and that this needs to go to directly to the human beings. It should not be spent on building the institution like the masjid, this zakat or the school. So it directly helps the human being and also it starts from your own community. You need to, the, the Quran sets the principle that you need to look around yourself in within your relatives, extended family, if there are people who are in need, you help them, then you go <coughs> next to. So if wherever you have gained this wealth, it should belong to that community. Un that community has the first right. It can be given, it's preferable if you give it directly, but it can be given through your religious institution and it can be given through uh, the other institutions. Similarly, our, uh, the involuntary or which is, which is the charity which is really, uh, which is kind of, which the, the Quran says that it is, it's kind of mandatory but it is, it's up to you that if you do that or not, it's sadaka. So it's the same term like the Hebrew, that's sadaka. So sadaka is a charity and then it comes that there are people who does not have mean. What should they do that, how should they charity? So the uh, Prophet Muhammad says that if, there is a saying that if you do not have wealth, then you just work and whatever you earn, you give something away to your fellow human beings. Then somebody asked him that if a person cannot work, he said that person can just help the, the, the poor and needy. Then the companion again asked that if that person cannot do that, then he, the, uh, the Prophet Muhammad said, then he should just urge others to do the goodness. And the, the companion again asked that uh, if he does not do that, so then he said he should just stay away from evil and it's also charity. So compassion uh, is innate to human uh, souls and I think the, the job of and what our religious institutions does, they bring that feeling out of human beings, they promote this uh, feeling of philanthropy and giving. Within, uh, uh, for our youth, the, the Islamic principle is that you teach them with your example, that you do with your actions, your kids should learn from your actions. So, like, 
I have challenged my eight-year-olds and they are having tough time that I told them you give hundred dollars out of your piggy bank this holidays and I'll double it up and then we'll do uh, the project for holidays will get twice for the kids that would need that. So that is the Islamic principle which I'm trying to set example for them. There's a saying that a person came to uh, Holy Prophet uh, Muhammad and he asked him that my kid uh, eats too many dates. <laughs> so, so he asked me why don't you come back in one week. So he came back one week and then the Prophet told the kid that okay excess of everything is bad. So the, so the gentleman asked him that why did not you uh, you, you uh, tell him the same thing a week ago. So the Prophet said, I stopped eating dates. <laughs> so, so that is the basic principle and I think the, as faith traditions we have so much in common and our, what we do as an institution to bring out that uh, which sometimes which is hidden uh, in our fast life. The faith helps us to uh, get that feeling out and to share our wealth with our fellow human beings. My goodness. It's so easy for us to tell how passionate each one of you is about this subject. And uh, that kind of brings us to a, a question that has uh, been forced on us uh, by some research released by the Pew Institute within the last couple of weeks. Uh, and it's uh, appreciating what you said, Dr. Cosby, that some of these trends are not across all communities, and particularly the African-American community. Uh, what this research showed is that nuns, not like ones that wear habits and are part of religious orders, but nuns, N-O-N-E-S, are on the rise, dramatically. That is, th those are the people who are not religiously affiliated at all and describe themselves as such. So the question is, given that many, if not most people, learn about philanthropy and generosity through their faith tradition, and given the rise of nuns, or the unaffiliated, what does this mean for philanthropy, giving, generosity in American society in general? Would we expect uh, declining involvement in religious institutions to lead to future generations that are significantly less generous? And what would that mean? Uh, so we'll start with you, Rabbi Rooks. If you can spin a word of hope on that for us, we would greatly appreciate it. <clears throat> um, you know, I think that we need to be fast on our feet and learn um, different ways to reach the younger generation. Um, I think that um, the training of young religious leaders who better understand their peers is good. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, congregations that, that um, really uh, welcome I mean, of course, everyone's welcome, I'm sure, in every mosque and church and synagogue, but, but really embrace the membership that is young. And um, I think if we seriously approach them and ask, you know, what, what kind of ideas do you have? What, what kinds of projects would work? I know um, in a campaign that we're doing now at Temple, Secure Our Future, um, they they started with the idea that we would have parlor meetings because when they first built the new building, I mean the temple's like 175 years old um, and it's had different locations and when they built the location where we're at now, um, maybe 30 years ago, that's what they did. They, they had parlor meetings in different people's homes and they made the pitch and people made their pledges and so, you know, um, there were skeptics, that's not going to work and, you know, but the, the, the seniors who were leading this project said, of course it's going to work. That's how we did it last time. And they tried it, and it, it didn't work very well. <laughs> so um, I, think, I think we need to have different ways of approaching different generations. Um, I am concerned about you know, declining religious life. But I, th I think... Um, not to disagree with the Pew study, because I think it's, you know, very well done. Um, I think that there are certain segments of religious communities that are not seeing that kind of fallout. And um, what gives me the most hope is that while um, my kids' generation 
may not be, well, my kids are. I'm very, very blessed. Having two parents for rabbis, the odds that both my children still love Judaism is really could not be a coincidence. It's a gift from God. <coughs> um, but when I talk to their friends and meet their peers, um, they may not be interested in religious life as we know it, some of them, but I think they're still very generous. I think that they have really caring souls. I think perhaps they've become a little jaded on you know, the political world and how, how much waste and graft and you know, how well is our money being spent. But I do think um, that in different ways they are perhaps equally if not more giving of themselves and their time and their energy uh, and their means in different ways. Dr. Bobar, uh, the same question. Um, sure. if, if you need me to repeat I, it, I'm happy to. No, I mean, just to add uh, Rabbi's comments, I think compassion and uh, philanthropy, that is innate to human nature. Our Humanity, it's a chain which is uh, tied by compassion and love for one another. Faith definitely acts as a catalyst. But even sometimes when I look around in my congregation that people even, they attend the services, but they are kind of not influenced by these principles which the faith want to teach them. So on the same token that uh, as if a person is spiritual, spirituality is, is important. A person can be uh, spiritual in different Way. So I think in uh, people who are not attending the services but they are still spiritual, that is one segment and I think that is, uh, they, are, uh, they are doing as much as other folks are doing. But if, whenever a disaster happens and when I see that people from all across the board, when all the faith traditions and whether they are agnostics or atheists, they all join their hands together and they help the humanity. So that gives me a hope that uh, that even in future we, the compassion and, uh, and, and love for each other, it will not decline. I, I like to be on the optimistic side and I, I think uh, it, it, it will not decline. That's a word of hope. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Cosby, what do you think uh, with the resurgence or the upsurgence in nuns, the, the uh, unaffiliated, what does this mean for philanthropy in general? Well, I think that it's a, the, ch the church must connect with the culture. And there is always a conservative streak in the church. And the conservatism often in the church often prohibits us from being innovative and using the tools of the culture to reach the culture. I'm often asked, how is it possible to draw so many people to St. Stephen Church that is located in the poorest zip code in, four, in Metro Louisville? Well, if you build a better mousetrap, even if it's in the hood, if you have something good in the hood, people will beat a path to your door. So what I've always attempted to do was a willingness to change the methodology without changing the message. The basic message and tenets of the faith is sacrosanct, but the way that we deliver the message, the methodology, uh, just for example, not staying in church too long you know, not making sure that the sermon is immortal without being everlasting. <laughs> um, you know, just um, being considerate of where uh, our culture is. For example, the first person on the cover of a Wheaties box was Lou Gehrig in 1936. Well, if I put Lou Gehrig on the cover of a Wheaties box, if you do that in 2015, then this generation won't connect. But if you put Stefan Carey on the cover, they will connect. 
So the packaging changes, but what's called in, in the Christian faith, what's called the core karugma, the core karugma, the core essence of the message, the tenets of the faith doesn't change. And one thing that Lou Gehrig will have with Stefan Carey is that while the packaging will change, uh, the content is still Wheaties. And uh, so that's, that's uh, I think, is what we have attempted to do, and I think that churches that are flexible in their methodology, I think, will be able to attract people because there is, in the word of Augustine, a God-shaped hole in every heart, and only God can fill the God-shaped hole. If Freddie the fish is washed up on the shore, and Freddie the fish is struggling and someone brings Freddie the Fish a Mercedes Benz and a condo, he's still not going to feel right. What's wrong with Freddie the Fish? He was made for water. And restless is my soul, Augustine says, until I find rest in thee. Like, Freddie the Fish will not be content until Freddie the Fish experiences water, and people are not content until they encounter the transcendent. Thank you. Thank you, all three of you. <clears throat> so we talked a little bit about uh, the religious underpinnings or overpinnings. Uh, the idea of tithing is something that uh, Christians and Jews uh, share in Islam. We've talked about the zakat, uh, one of the five pillars of Islam. Um, as a leader in your faith tradition and one well-versed in the scriptures of your tradition, where do you think it should go? the tithe of the zakat. Is it to go to the house of worship to support its ministries, its mission, its staff, its bills, uh, its service to the community? Or can the obligation for percentage-based giving be met by giving to other charities, nonprofits who say serve the poor? And we'll just start with you, sure. Dr. Babar, if we could. Yeah. As I said earlier that it's uh, there are different schools of thought in Islam, but uh, the, the majority of them on the zakat, which is the mandatory uh, philanthropic contribution a Muslim have to make, it's, there are fixed categories and, they, and those are all belong to the human beings. There is one thing which often the religious institution mm -hmm. use that for the cause of God, but the majority of uh, the scholars they believe that it should go directly to the uh, human beings. It should not be used on the construction of the building. It, the Holy Quran says the only one thing where it's not with the direct uh, human being, it's on those who administer the zakat. So it can be paid towards them, but otherwise it should go directly to the human being, not uh, for the construction of the Islamic school, m mosque. It, there, but some scholars have done the interpretation from the cause of God that okay, the building a mosque is a cause of God. But the way uh, in my life, I have never uh, given uh, my mandatory zakat towards uh, a building. I have always tried to give it to a, directly to a human being because zakat is the minimum. Whatever contributions I give to my mosque, and that's from my sadkar, my other general contributions which I'm doing. So this mandatory zakat, it goes directly uh, towards the human beings and rest of my contributions, I can support the mission of my mosque and help them out. Good. Dr. Cosby. <coughs> well, um, because the, the, the church is so, such a vital institution in our community, 99.9%, um, .9 excuse me, 100% of all African Americans, t pastors teach that the tithe belongs to the storehouse. Uh, bring ye the tithe to the storehouse, as Malachi would put it. So we equate the storehouse with the institutional church because of how important uh, the church is. Um, the church, on the, as a result of receiving the tithes, if it is true to its historic mission, helps the poor and helps create networks where African American empowerment and institutions and building, uh, building institutions and businesses takes place. Um, one of our models is 
that our goal is to be internally strong, but externally focused. And we cannot be externally focused until we are first internally strong. I mean, if you're on an airplane, uh, the, the flight instructor will tell you that in the event that there is a decrease of oxygen in the cabin, oxygen mass will be deployed. If you're sitting next to someone, first take the oxygen yourself and then apply the oxygen to the person next to you that you're caring for. And the rationale is that is if you fall out, you will be in no position to help someone else. So if the church is not internally strong, it will not be in a position to build the family life centers, to do the things that are critically needed um, in our community. So we stress the importance of giving to the institutional church. However, there has been much abuse with that. And I think that what the nuns, especially African-American millennials, want is integrity. So for example, I have leverage, moral leverage in my community because although I pastor a progressive and launched church, I have not purchased a new car in 15 years. I still live in the hood. So I never left West Louisville. So that gives me moral leverage when I can say to them, you know, I'm not taking your money and your contributions. Or like here at, St. at Simmons, one way I was able to get this church strong and have the moral authority to ask people to give is because for 10 consecutive years, every dime that I was given, I gave back. So my salary was almost $100,000 a year as the president of the school, but I never collected one penny of that salary. So I turned my entire $100,000 back over to this school so that kids can go to school, which means I'm probably the only president in the state of Kentucky, in the history of the state of Kentucky, who returned his offering back. That is what caused other people to say, if he's willing to make that sacrifice, then I am too. It's powerful. Um, we don't talk about tithes much in the Jewish community. Uh, the biblical concept of a tithe, 10% of your income, and you bring 10% of the harvest to the temple and the pilgrimage festivals, and, and I'm sure everyone knows a lot about that. Um, but the tithe also included things that our government takes care of, it included um, what we would now say things like, you know, uh, Social Security and Medicare, Medicaid, um, the police, the fire department, the, the building of roads, the protecting of the citizens. Um, and so in that sense, I don't know, maybe it's just in Reform Judaism, but, but we don't hear a lot of talk about tithing. So I'm just going to kind of turn it. Um, in our congregation, when I first came 27 years ago to the temple, dues were a certain amount, and a third of the members paid that, and a third of the members paid less, and a third of the members paid more, because they could, and because they knew not everyone else could. And no one is turned away on the basis of you know, financial inability to pay. If you want to be a member of the temple, then you're a member. We have members who pay nothing. We have members who pay $50 a year. But to keep the lights on and to keep the, the salaries of, you know, we have the maintenance staff and the, the support staff and the clergy and the educator and, you know, I mean, it's, it's a big business running a synagogue or a church or a mosque. And, and ours includes a school. Um, and um, so we have dues or financial commitment that we ask people to make. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the numbers are now, but after the economic crash uh, in 2008 or whatever, we had almost 50% of our membership not able to pay standard dues. Um, and it, it, it became a, a real issue. 
Um, you know, we had already tightened the belt a, a bunch of times, and there wasn't a lot of, pardon the expression, pork to trim. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, Rabbi Hillel, who lived just a little bit before the life of Jesus, um, taught that if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? So if the Jewish community, the members of the temple, aren't going to support and take care of our synagogue, who will do it? Right. This is a three-part statement, so wait for it. So if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? But if I am for myself alone, what am I? So if all I care about is my congregation or even the broader Jewish community in Louisville, what, I, what am I? What, what's even the purpose of having a synagogue? So there's a tremendous amount of philanthropy from the Jewish community that also goes to the broader community. Um, and before I go off on that tangent, I want to let you know Rabbi Hillel's third statement, which was, if not now, when? Mm -hmm. And I really like that a lot. Um, but regarding um, outside of maintenance of synagogue, structure, I mean, you know, now our roof is 30 years old, the boiler's about to go, and, you know, different things like that. But um, Jews kind of invented the concept of a federated charity, the idea that everybody would give in, and that's what the Jewish community of Louisville or the Federation, the Jewish Federation of Louisville is, that, that everybody would donate and they would have their own allocations committee, and it would go to all these different organizations. Some of it goes to the Jewish Family and Career Services, which is like Catholic family services. Doesn't only serve Catholics. The Jewish community, the Jewish, Jewish Family and Career Services doesn't only serve Jews. In fact, I think maybe only half their work is with. Jewish people, and they offer, you know, counseling and vocational training and um, career guidance and regular, you know, marital counseling and anything like that. Um, and um, so a large chunk of the community dollars goes to support that, and it goes to support a little bit, goes to Hillel at the university, and um, some of it goes to support um, the, the Jewish Community Center, and some of it goes to Israel, and some of it goes to Jews living in the former Soviet Union. Some of it goes, um, anyway, different, different organizations. Um, and and I, I think that American Jews have really, really got a good handle on that. You know, if I'm for myself alone, what am I? I you know, I mean, we have members who give much more money to other philanthropic organizations uh, than they do the temple. And, you know, I, I don't have a problem with that as long as they are giving to the temple. There are a few who, uh, you know, it's, it all goes to, you know, whatever it is, U of L or United Way or whatever. But, but we need names. No, I'm yeah. <laughs> Mentioning no names. Um, but, you know, and that's like um, we were talking earlier. I'm very involved in Crusade for Children. Um, that's, that's, you know, just a, a, a pet. Mm organization of mine. So, you know, I mean, we save money all year long to make a big pledge to Crusade for Children. Um, and I, I just think that, that um, you know, um, you were talking about, Babar, about um, the, the first you give to your family and your extended family and your community and this and that. And um, Maimonides, like 12th century, um, he did a lot of stuff on Sadaka, and he made um, 12 rungs or eight rungs, depending on what you're reading, of, of giving and how to give and how much to give. Um, and he also said, you know, in these ever broadening circles, that yeah, first you have to feed and educate your own kids. If you can't put food on the table at dinner for your own children, then you know you need help, and it's, you shouldn't be ashamed to ask for it. And then broader and broader and broader, and including your neighborhood, your whole community, and what is our community? I mean, our community is Louisville, our community is Kentucky, our community is the United States, and we are all global citizens. And so we should all 
be, um, I don't think Maimonides used the term global citizens in the 12th century, but, <laughs> but, but the idea is that you, know, you, you can't have tunnel vision and say, I'm only going to look at, you know, I only care about the Muslims, or I only care about the Jews, or, or African Americans. I mean, we're all children of God. We all need to work together to help other children of God, and, and not just people. I mean, animals and, and art and culture, and you know, it, it takes all of us to make a thriving community. Amen. So I believe we do have some time left for questions. Uh, where, as, as you listen to these uh, faith leaders and great thinkers, uh, what is bubbling up for you as a question? There's a microphone right there, uh, if you feel like stepping to that. Um, we do have time for just a few. Well, if not, we want to thank you all again for being here and for uh, being a part of this conversation, for being a part of the larger conversation of how various faiths here in Louisville relate to one another and serve people created in the image of God together. Uh, Can I tell a little tiny story? as a closing kind of thing, if that would be okay. Does anybody object? <laughs> <laughs> I just, because uh, I, I, just, I love this story. It's, it's a Hasidic story um, about uh, a, a Rebbe who decides that he's going to spend the entire day devoted to reciting psalms. And, and, you know, that's a very holy thing. And he's going to spend the entire, entire day. And as evening was coming on, uh, a messenger came and said that this great Rebbe, who actually was his mentor, uh, had sent him to bring him. And, um, oh, the days before cell phones, right? And um, he said, okay, well, as soon as I finish, I'll be there. So the messenger goes, okay, that was not my phone, that wasn't a cue. <laughs> um, so he, he, the messenger comes back a little while later and says, I'm sorry, but the Rebbe says, you need to come right now. And so, you know, he goes with the guy, he goes up to the great Rebbe, and um, the rabbi said, what delayed you? And he said, I, was reci I had decided to spend the whole day reciting psalms. And the rabbi says to him, you know, angels can recite psalms. Angels can chant the most beautiful songs to God that there are. Only a human being can do righteousness and justice. And I have a person here who I need money to help them because they are poor and they are hungry. And that's something that no angel can do only a human being. And we are all angels. In Hebrew, the word angel is malach, which is a messenger. Sometimes in the Bible, you're not sure. Are they humans? Are they, I, I know there are many angels sitting out there because I recognize one or two of you myself. So the earthly messengers or angels, we are the ones who have that incredible gift from God to make a difference in other people's lives, something that even angels can't do. Good story. I like stories. <laughs> uh, and now, uh, just thank you to each and every one of you for spending your time here this evening. Uh, whether your passion is philanthropy or interfaith relations or a combination of the two, thank you for what you mean to this community and what you mean to these two fine organizations. And have a wonderful night. Be careful going home and stay dry. <laughs>